Hi, welcome to Box on the Box Rock and Celluloid, Bop Rock for short. Uh, so today I'm going to be looking at a master of cinema, one of my all-time favourite filmmakers, the great Brian De Palma. So Brian De Palma is born 1940 and he's one of the movie brats. So there's four other key movie brats, Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. A couple of, three other guys who would also flag up in this would be Paul Schrader, who's principally known as much for writing as well. Um, and uh, John Carpenter sort of, but not directly connected with these guys, and John Melius as well. Um, the, the difference is the previous guys I mentioned will work together or know each other, whereas Carpenter's uh, slightly outside that. But what defines the movie brats is the first generation of filmmakers were brought up purely on cinema. So the previous generation of filmmakers would have you know, been involved in theatre, or reading books, radio, coming to Hollywood in an earlier time, uh, before kind of film uh, grammar's properly been developed uh, and so on, uh, these guys have been able to watch Ford, Hawks, Hitchcock, Wells, uh, the great silent films, and they've learnt their trade from that. Uh, just to give you an example, a guy born at the same time, not a movie brat, but born 1939, Paul Verhoeven, the Dutch director, he went to see Vertigo 25 times. So that's how these guys learn the filmmaking process, they watch films over and over in the movie theatre. I think Scorsese, you know, he'd go in and just stay in his seat and when the next screening came on, he'd just watch the film again. Okay, so they're obsessives. So De Palma has quite an interesting childhood. He's, uh, I think his dad's an orthopaedic surgeon, uh, but his dad was adulterous. He didn't have a great relationship with him and one thing he did was he actually kind of spied on his dad with surveillance equipment to check uh, if he was being adulterous. And this is a theme that will, will pop up in De Palma films. Often he has people uh, in the medical profession uh, in, in dodgy roles, but he also, a lot of his films it, it, it have surveillance in them, uh, being, being looked at, looking at people, you know, unawares and things like that. But also how people perceive sound and image. Um, so he starts off more as an experimental filmmaker after he's uh, studied, I think he was studying physics, he kind of got drawn into film and did some courses on that. And he was in the Greenwich Village scene in New York. Uh, he's very influenced by John Goddard. So he was kind of part of the leftist film movement around that area. So his early films uh, are experimental and he meets up with a young actor who he works with uh, initially, and that would be fairly innocuous, but that guy's name's Robert De Niro. So they actually made uh, a couple of films, I think it could be Greetings in High Mom. Don't quote me on that. Uh, now I must confess, I haven't seen any of his early films. There's Murder a la Modern Greetings in 1968, The Wedding Party in High Mom in 1969, 1970, just something called Dionysus in 69, I think this is a film performance of uh, Dionysus and it uses split screen technique and that's a technique we've become famous for. Then his first Hollywood film uh, is a film called Get to Know Your Rabbit, this was a really bad experience for him, uh, some kind of counterculture comedy starring Tommy Smothers and Orson Welles. Um, I suspect working with Orson Welles may have been quite a great experience for him because he would have been uh, in the great man's work. So basically his first kind of film that I would say uh, is of note is 1972 Sisters and I actually thought this was 1973. What's interesting with this is it's a pure Hitch Hitchcockian kind of conceit, uh, aping Psycho, um, but it uses a score by Bernard Herrmann. So but basically the great Hitchcock composer Bernard Herrmann had been on, on his downers after doing the score for Marnie in 1964 um, with Hitchcock. Uh, he did the score for Tom Curtin, but Hitchcock didn't like it. They fell out um, really badly. Never spoke to each other again, I believe. Uh, and then Herman, you know, was kind of out of the Hollywood scene, but he actually scored a couple of films, uh, British kind of psycho thrillers, um, uh, Twisted Nerves starring Howell Bennett and Endless Night also starring Howell Bennett. Well worth checking out those films and really cool Bernard, Bernard Herman scores. So basically, yeah, um, De Palma's the first guy to tap him. Uh, for a score later on, Scorsese will tap him for an, his final score, his incredible score for Taxi Driver, which is kind of like this dark urban jazz score. But anyway, Sisters also stars Margot Kidder, uh, her of Superman fame, Lois Lane, uh, and uh, Jennifer Salt, she's actually more of a film producer now, I think, behind the scenes. And there's an actor in it called Win William Finley, and he'll actually turn up in uh, a few other De Palma films, The Fury and Fountain of the Paradise. So this is a good, it's a good 6 out of 10. It's a Hitchcockian slasher thriller. Um, it's got an unusual ending, and this draws him to the attention of film critics like Roger Ebert and Pauline Kael, who will be champions of his work. 
Um, so next up is uh, Phantom of the Paradise. So this is kind of, uh, I really love this film. I'm not a Rocky Horror fan. This predates Rocky Horror by a year. Uh, it's a kind of glitter rock musical. Um, and it stars Paul Williams as this DJ called um, Swan. Um, obviously, people watching this won't be aware of this, but I live in uh, the area of uh, England called Newcastle. Um, people watching this in Newcastle will know there was a rock club called the Mayfair and had a DJ called Little Jeff. And actual fact, Little Jeff looked quite a lot like Paul Williams. So, uh, Sally's no longer sorry, pay Little Jeff. But um, just an interesting point there. But Fan of the Paradise, yeah, William Finley's in it. Um, Jessica, I've forgotten her second name. But it's got some really cool songs on it, and it's basically a skit on Phantom of the Opera, but in a, a rock, glitter rock, glam rock setting. And probably coming a little late uh, in the day, the kind of glam thing. Um, but it's, it's a cool film, it's a, it's a fun film, it's got split screen sequences, and, uh, you know, De Palma has a lot of fun with this. Uh, then he makes two films in 76. He does Obsession with Cliff Robinson, uh, again, Bernard Herman scores this. What's most interesting about this, it's virtually a kind of remake of Hitchcock's Vertigo. So he takes the basic themes of Vertigo, but this time it involves a kid and a missing daughter. Uh, and basically, you know, uh, explores the themes of Vertigo but via this. Um, it actually has John Lithgow in it as well. Again, he's an actor who will work with in um, uh, Blowout and um, Raising Kane. So he, he turns up in a other films so this is something De Palma will do he'll, he'll have not a stock reference company but he's got guys he likes to use um, this film's not great uh, but it, like a lot of De Palma films this is what's interesting about De Palma his films are never boring they're never uninteresting you know De Palma's never going to make a film like Lincoln like Spielberg does which is like uh, got fantastic acting is completely dull you know you'll never catch De Palma doing that um so 1976 is the watershed your moment where he has his breakout hits. A couple has had the Godfather in 72. Uh, Scorsese's kind of broken out um, uh, with uh, Alice doesn't live here anymore and then Taxi Driver. Scorsese never really had a big hit until he started working with him um, until the 90s. Um, obviously Lucas is uh, about to explode. Um, no, he's had American Graffiti in 1973. So all his mates have kind of had big hits and this hit this film uh, isn't as uh, big a hit as those films, but it's a horror classic. It's um, a masterpiece. It's Carrie. Um, so this will, uh, with this film, De Palma really brings a couple of his signature techniques into play. That's the use of slow motion montage and split screen effects. Uh, and the um, climax of this film is a, a sort of cinematic ma masterclass in kind of shots, editing, and pre-planning, I think, um, so basically, the Palmer's one of those guys. Uh, I don't know where he storyboards, but he's he's got all everything in his head, and he knows exactly what he needs to shoot to bring it together. If you watch the climax of Carrie, I mean, it really is a feat of uh, of cinematic mastery. Um, also, uh, I think this will be one of the early things where accusations of misogyny will come in to play. So this is something that will plague De Palma is his treatment of women. Uh, on screen, although I think it treats uh, Sissy Space as quite a very, very sympathetically. Um, I think this film grosses about thirty million dollars back in the day, um, seventy six. Um, so you know, you're talking about now it would be about a hundred and thirty, hundred fifty million dollar gross. So it's it's a big hit on the budget it's on, uh, but not the kind of level of hit that Lucas had Spielberg and those guys. Um, also has that famous shock ending as well. Um, which is filmed uh, backwards. Well, it's played backwards if you watch the background of cars going backwards. So this is, uh, yeah, it's his first um, first great film. He'll make sort of five films in his career that I think, uh, you know, are masterpieces. Um, 78, he does The Fury. Apparently with this, he was just looking for something to do. After Carrie, he, you know, the offers didn't really come in like he expected. So The Fury's a psychic horror thriller. Again, it's got William Finley in it, a character actually he likes to use in a small role. Role Amy Irving, who would later marry Steven Spielberg, so a bit of connection there. So just mentioned that Spielberg and De Palma are very good mates. Um, uh, Spielberg's kind of mates with all of them, uh, and they all know each other, but he's the kind of central guy in the movie brat, uh, movie brat group, I guess. Um, but some, yeah, so The Fury, uh, it's, got, it's got some really cool sequences in it. Um, I really like it, I've always liked it. 
it's got the great John Cassavetes in it. Uh, interesting, John Cassavetes just did these kind of films for the money so he can make his own uh, films. Um, you know, the founding father of American independent cinema and the guy who inspired Scorsese to make Mean Streets. Um, so again, another movie brat connection there. But um, so this is really good. It's got a great climax. Uh, Kirk Douglas is in it. Uh, it's probably Kirk Douglas's last uh, really good film, really good film role. So although not the level of Carrie, it's kind of continuing that theme of uh, psychic power. Uh, I really like it. Um, it's top. Um, then he does a film called Home Movies. Uh, and um, yeah, that's just a, a little independent film. I must confess, I've never seen this. It's just never on TV. Uh, it's got Kirk Douglas and Nancy Allen, who will later marry. Uh, sorry, that's 1980. Apologies. Then in 1980, he makes his next big, pretty big hit, and it's the film Dressed to Kill. Now, the gross of this, I'll just check, and we'll see how well Brian's doing. $31 million gross, $32 million, sorry. Um, yeah, so about $100 million now. So this is where the Hitchcock comparisons come in. Again, it no, owes a nod to Psycho. Um, uh, it has uh, a cross-dressing... Um, I suppose transgender or wanting to, you know, want to transition uh, character murderer. So that's controversial in itself. Um, and this is where his accusations of misogyny really come to the fore. And I do think there is uh, grounds for this. I think the treatment of Angie Dickinson's character is really mean. It's really horrible. And it's basically she she kind of has a, a one one night one afternoon stand, but the guys uh, she finds that the guys tested positive for um. Uh, sexually transmitted disease and um, uh, yeah it just kind of it's like the narrative is kind of punishing her um, but it's brilliantly shot this it's got some great sequences the the murder central murder sequence uh, is it, again it's a tour de force of what the guy what Brian De Palma does well Nancy Allen's really good Keith Gordon's good he became a, a good filmmaker himself obviously he's in the great Christine as well Arnie Cunningham one of my other faith films of mine um uh, and uh, yeah, the other thing is, I remember watching Movie Drum with uh, the filmmaker Alex Cox. This was a cult. Uh, it was a TV program in the late late '80s into the '90s. Basically, Alex Cox, the filmmaker, would introduce a cult film, uh, and then the film would play. And I can't remember what the De Palma choice was. Uh, it might have been Sisters, but he correct he correctly, I think, identified that although uh, De Palma's compared to Hitchcock, in actual fact, his films like this. Uh, have a lot more in common with uh, Dario Argento's Giallo films. So if you watch The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Deep Red, Four Flies on Grey Velvet and uh, Cat of Nine Tails, Tenebrae, um, these types of sort of slasher films with flashy camera work but don't always have a logical plot. Uh, you know, you could say De Palma's in that lineage as much uh, as, as Hitchcock. So I think Argento was called the Italian Hitchcock. You know, so there's that little uh, point there. Um, then he makes uh, a film that's a flop at the time, uh, but it's, I think it's Quentin Tarantino's, one of his favourite films of all time, um, and that's Blowout. Uh, this is a, a real unsung masterpiece. So this is his his uh, addition to the conspiracy thriller. So obviously Coppola's made the conversation. Um, uh, Alan J. Pakula, not a movie brat, but you got a parallax view and that. But this is also a riff on Blow Up, uh, the uh, Michelangelo Antonio film. So again, he's touching base with his European influences there, although he's more influenced by the French New Wave. Um, he's obviously liked the film Blow Up back in 66 in that height of counterculture era. So this is a spin on that. Basically, uh, John Travolta's a sound guy and he records, he's out recording sound and he records a car accident, but then he realises it's actually been the sun shot the tire out, tire out and it's an assassination, a political assassination. So this allows um, De Palma to explore, again, that he didn't dress to kill as well, themes of surveillance, but sound and how we perceive sound and image. So it's got that kind of um, metatextual thing where you've got this film, but you've also got the uh, Dajay elements of film being played with, uh, and he's commenting that it's got an absolutely stunning musical score by Pino Donaggio. Um, so Pino Donaggio did the score for Carrie. The score for this film, the main theme, I think, is the saddest, most beautiful piece of music, or one of them ever written for film, and he's right up there with the best of sort of Morricone. Um, uh, uh, John Lithgow's very good in this as a kind of killer hitman, um, posing as someone called a Liberty Bell Strangler. 
it's really tragic. Travolta's great, and um, this was the film that really got Travolta the Pulp Fiction job. Like say flop at the time, but it had some great reviews, and it's it's since become uh, um, a bit of a unsung masterpiece. So now you know Carrie and Blowout, two two fantastic films. Just mentioning at this point, it's probably a good time to to slip in about the Tarantino thing, and I think although the other movie brats are hugely successful, I think De Palma's is the director's director. And I play guitar. And um, people often say Jeff Beck is the guitarist guitarist. So even though Jeff Beck doesn't have the big commercial success of Eric Clapton or Jimi Hendrix as much, guitarists know that he's one of the best. And I think it's the same De Palma in a director's sense. Film directors love De Palma. Uh, and I think they like the way he, he kind of plays with images uh, for its own sake in a way and explores techniques. Edgar Wright was another one I watched the thing recently and he had a broke down a segment from Carrie the climax and he's another example of a director who's a big De Palma fan if you um uh Hughes Brothers as well I think you know if you you look into uh read interviews and stuff like that with filmmakers De Palma's name always pops up not that other guys don't but he's a filmmaker's filmmaker um so his next film is a yeah yeah, actually, he's having a really good run here. It's another fucking goddamn masterpiece. It's Scarface again, not um, a quite a reasonable size hit at the time. But the problem for this film was the budget was so much. I'll just go into that. So this film uh, box office was sixty six million, but its budget was twenty three to thirty seven. Is here? I think it was over thirty. So it wasn't um, although it grossed like uh, it wasn't very profitable or profitable at all. Probably is now. Of course, this is like magnificent, um, one of the great eighties. So just it's just, it's just a film that gets better every year. I think uh, it really is like a fine wine. Pacino, and this is when he first teams up with Al Pacino. Pacino just goes on a glorious ten with his performance. We've got a great um, supporting cast. Breakout role from Michelle Pfeiffer. Numerous great dialogue, numerous great sequences. Uh, you know, I've actually covered this in in some other things as well. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's brilliant, this one. Uh, next film, Body Double. Uh, this is another Hitchcock riff. Again, kind of weird, you know, he's come off Scarface and then he goes in and does a weird kind of slasher flick. Stars Melanie Griffiths, Craig Wasson, a little-known actor, but he's in Ghost Story, based on the Peter Stroud book. Again, Pino Dinaggio's back. I think what's interesting about this, this is the first film that's lensed by Stephen H. Burham. So this is one of his key collaborators, cinematographer, um, and another guy he'd, he'd like to use was Vilma Sigmund. Uh, so he uh, principally uses those two cinematographers from now on in. Sorry, I'm just, um, something just popping up on my screen there. Um, so this film's, again, the misogyny rears its head again because um, a woman gets drilled through the floor with a big drill. It's actually Mandy Winger, um, the actress Deborah Shelton, who played Mandy Winger in Dallas. Um, and it's got a weird ending. It, it's it's um, uh, and this type of ending will appear later in a film called Snake Eyes. I don't understand the ending. It just kind of has Craig Wasson shooting a scene from a film, a porn film. I think he's a porn actor in it, and um, yeah, it just has the credits over it, and he'll actually revisit that. But that's the thing with De Palma films. He will just do kind of crazy things. Um, he doesn't follow a pattern. He is a rebel. Um, Next up, we just look at Wise Guys. I must confess, I've never seen this. It's never on TV, and this is a comedy. It's got Danny DeVito in it and an actor called Joe Piscopo. Um, I couldn't tell you what it's like. Um, sometimes when I'm doing these things, you know, I'm a big film fan, but sometimes I haven't seen absolutely every film. Um, uh, but I, you know, always try to check out stuff. But a lot of departments I've seen, you know, several times. So, in actual fact, at this point, he's in need of a hit. His blowout's not made money. Scarface hasn't been as profitable. Uh, Wise Guys is a flop. Um, he needs a big studio hit. And although I'm not quite as fond of this film as other people are, I would call it one of his key films. It's the 1987's The Untouchables. So this is a lot of great fun. This um, Stephen H. Burns back for the cinematography. Great sort of more 80s Ennio Morricone score. Breakout star performance, uh, Building on No Way Out from Kevin Costner. And two great character supporting parts from De Niro and of course the Oscar winning Sean Connery so this is where he brings um, his cinematic mastery in to play and he basically uh, 
So one thing, you know, De Palma does, he'll do kind of tribute sequences and sequences that are influenced by the great filmmakers. And he does a riff on uh, Eisenstein's Odessa, Odessa Step sequence from Bashar Potemkin, one of the early great silent films and uh, one of the most influential films in terms of film editing and film grammar in, in its uh, growth, as it were. And when I say film grammar, I mean the language of film there, um, like how editing works and shot composition and so on. Um, so, like this film, yeah, the Odessa Step sequence he riffs on his uh, shootout at a train station. I watched the film recently. Uh, and although like the, there's elements of the film and not as into that sequence, it's just stunning. I mean, he's the only guy, um, the only guy who can do this uh, the way he does it. Yeah, there's other great filmmakers and they've got their great things, but De Palma, you know, the way it builds up, the way the editing, the the, the, the way you know when he when he films stuff in slow mo, so he uses an overcrank camera, so that means you know he's going to be running at ninety six, one hundred twenty frames a second. Um, you know, he's got to make that decision really. In his head, yeah, this speed's gonna work. This he's got it all mapped out in his head. That's the thing, you know. He's he's using multiple film speeds, uh, multiple shots, and he, he brings it together. And just the payoff at the end of the sequence is it's it's superb, uh, absolute, you know, brilliant. It's also got a shot in it as well, which he's, he's he's riffed on later on, where he has an elevator sequence and he has a long take, and you know the camera kind of comes out of the elevator and tracks down the corridor. And, he builds suspense that way with his long takes, I should um, mention as well. He, he's a, a fan of the long take again. Obviously Hitchcock and Wells both use long takes, uh, other filmmakers as well. Um, but De Palma's very kind of flashy with them, you know, in some ways he'll use steady cam shots. Uh, sustained. So his next film uh, is Casualties of War. Um, so this is a film uh, he felt he'd made his best film. Steven Spielberg saw it, raved about it. Um, he worked his balls off on it and it actually flopped and he had a bit of a nervous breakdown. I think he collapsed and he had to be hospitalised, bless him. I saw this at the pictures at the time. This was actually the first film I ever saw in a multiplex cinema. So here in Newcastle, we had a Warner Brothers cinema over over in an area called Manus. Uh, and I went over there, so the first one I saw there. I've got mixed feelings about this film. I went on a trip to Vietnam, holiday to Vietnam three years ago, and I came back and got a lot of Vietnam films and I watched this with my wife and she just felt it was like a rape film and I would agree it is very rapey to me and again the misogyny. Uh, although I don't think De Palma's really means it to be that, it's just, you know, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I think it's more about tarnished masculinity and it's all about like uh, the fact that Michael J. Fox should act and doesn't and it's all about him and not about the victim. Um, I think Penn's pretty amazing. It's amazing, but he's just standing in the rain and he mentions like about I, uh, that I will walk through the valley, shadow of death, or something like that, in the valley of death, I will fear no evil. And then he says, because I'm the meanest motherfucker in the valley. Um, but he's a horrible character. Um, the the crew are horrible. Um, you know the platoon are really horrible in this. Uh, but um, uh, it's it's actually based on an article for the New Yorker from nineteen sixty nine. Um, but I still there's still aspects of this film I like. It's got powerful sequences. It's got bits that are powerfully shot. I feel for me where it's gone wrong is the casting of Michael J. Fox. I just think as an actor he's too clean cut but in the wrong way he's not like Charlie Sheen who works really beautifully well in Platoon uh, he just needed someone different to play off Penn um, it doesn't quite work for me uh, and it's weird you know by that point it came a little late in the cycle of Nam films you had Platoon in 86 Full Metal Jacket 87 uh, you've also got Born on the 4th of July in 1989 which is a better film but it's still it's still worth checking out then he gets The Bonfire of the Vanities based on the bestseller it's a flop um, I've only seen this film once and once was enough. There's actually a book written about the making of this film called The Devil's Candy by, I think, an author called Julie Salmon. It's really worth uh, reading. Uh, and it kind of shows you kind of uh, De Palma's like, you know, he liked, he liked to catnap apparently. So, you know, he liked a 15 minute catnap in his trailer in the middle of the day and you were not to disturb him. Uh, but there's lots of interesting stuff in this book about second unit photography. There's a shot of the Chrysler building of one of the eagles. Uh, and um, a guy, you know, uh, he sent one of his second unit to shoot that, and that was cool. This opens with a six minute steady cam take, so this is where De Palma starts to up his steady camness, and he will try and break his own steady cam records. 
uh, from here on in. Um, so it's uh, Bruce Willis, yeah, it follows in him an elevator again, elevator shot, um, and there's various shenanigans going on. It's a six minute opening take, which draws attention to itself a bit, but the film was a flop. So again, he's in need of a hit, but he goes into a smaller film. I love this, uh, and it's actually a reason besides it. It was only $12 million budget, and it made $37 million. So he makes a smaller film produced by his then wife, Gail Ann Hurd. I think he's been married three times. He's divorced again, so like a lot of these guys, he's not easy to live with, I imagine. But Raising Cane's a lot of fun. So basically what he does in this is he uh, does a, a, a post-modern meta meta textual take on himself he's kind of doing lots of sequences in this film that are like sequences he's had in other films he's got John Lithgow in it who gives a great performance uh, the ending's amazing there's a pure Argento ending that has no logic at all uh, Stephen uh, bows back from Scarface again using a different actor um, it's got great steady cam, great slow-mo uh, Playful bits, there's a, a, a weird bit with the Lolita Davidovich character as she gets her own kind of little sequence bit, um, uh, which is very playful. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun, this film. It's a, it's a really good second second level with a Palmer film. Uh, next up, 93, he makes one of his other masterpieces for me. Although it's got its flaws, it's a little too long. 1993's Kalita's Way. I've actually covered this in more detail uh, on my uh, American Crime Films uh, top 10. Then I'm giving it away. So, you know, I maybe won't talk about this too much, but it's fantastically shot. Pacino's magnificent, Penn's incredible, and it features, for me, one of his great long takes uh, in the climax. Uh, he does a three minute steady time take, uh, obviously, in, in uh, with a lot of help from his camera operator and uh, Stephen H. Burham, who does the photography, the cinematography, uh, and it's a stunning sequence. The, the whole climax of this film is just a masterclass. Um, uh, but it was a reasonable sized hit, but again, he's, he's kind of in need of a hit. And then he makes Mission Impossible, the first Mission Impossible film. And it's weird, this is his first big blockbuster. In fact, it's his only blockbuster. So this film grossed, uh, I think, just going to check the figure, yeah, $458 million uh, back in 1996. So if he released it a day, you would be looking at about a billion dollar gross. So it's a, it's a Marvel size gross, this. So it was a big hit. Uh, Remember going to see this at the pictures, and yeah, I think he does a really good job. I mean, there's some ropey CGI in it, but what's great is Tom Cruise uh, and um, the producers allow him to de Palmer it. Uh, so it's got uh, the actual fact the bit where he breaks into the vault, de Palma designed all that. Maybe in the script it said, oh, he breaks into a vault, or maybe de Palma says, we need to get this list, you know, this disc. I'll have him breaking into a vault. How do I do that? And it's awesome, you know, the, the, the bit of sweat dripping and he's like a spider in the web. Um, but the opening sequence is really good with cutaway set shots. So we've got the elevators, bloody lift shafts again. Um, uh, and he does something in this, actually, he does a great riff on Hitchcock. There's an obscure Hitchcock film called Stage Fright from 1950, starring Jane Wyman. And it has something in it called a lying flashback. So that's where the character... Uh, tells um, a story but it's flashing back to what happened but the, the visuals are telling us what actually happened it's a lying flashback and he does this with the John Voight character near the end so I love this sequence you know if you see stage fright I've only seen it once but check it out the lying flashback sequence so it has a big hit so it's like great Brian he's set up and then he goes and makes Snake Eyes with Nicolas Cage this has got an insane steady cam take at the start I think it's 16 minutes but it uses disguise cuts um just quickly, uh, it doesn't say on here, sorry, I'm just looking at Wikipedia. I think it's 16 minutes, but um, basically it follows him into the boxing match and everything, but it has disguise cuts, so, um, you know, the camera will pan across and the cut will be there. Um, but it's got this crazy ending where it's like the end of um, Body Double, where I think Nicolas Cage is just on a building site and there's credits going up. I quite like this film. It's uh, It was supposed to have a, a hurricane hit at the end, uh, and they did all the effects, and it uh, it does have a hurricane coming in it, but they got rid of that and then had a different ending. Um, the climax is a little sort of raising Kane-ish. Um, I remember, actually, this was the first film I ever saw at cinema. I was on holiday in America, and it was the first film we went to see. Well, me and my mate, actually, the guy does the thumbnails for this. Gary, I'm not on Facebook, Foley. He, uh, we went to see this at the pictures, so we'd got to Los Angeles, we'd been there a couple of days, let's go and see a movie, and Snake Eyes was it. It's, it's always kind of been a 6 out of 10 for me, but 
he really needed to build on the box office success of Mission Impossible. And this film, $73 million budget, $104 million gross. So, so he's back down the food chain again, where he was, he was at, you know, Spielberg level-ish. Uh, then he does Mission to Mars. Again, this has got some great shots in it, but it acting so bad, the script. And he's obviously, you know, wanting to do a kind of 2001 thing. I think he just did this because there was nothing else on offer. Um, I have... I haven't seen it for a long time. Uh, Gary Sinise is in it, but it's got a dreadful ending, Gary Sinise. It's not great, the performances, and Tim Robbins. I mean, what were they all thinking? But um, it's got some cool visuals in it, some great camera moving through the ship. But obviously, you know, he's going to do that sort of thing well. I'll have to watch it again, but it wasn't very good. So then he's kind of in a situation where he can't get funding from Hollywood, and then he does Femme Fatale uh, and... Yeah, he's, he's got um, foreign producers in this. Um, just checking the budget, 35 million, yeah. Country, France, Germany, United States. Apologies, just looking at some of the intel here. And yeah, I think this has got like, you know, f uh, funding from European countries. I quite like this. Again, it's a sort of typical De Palma, Hitchcockian thriller. Um, Antonio Banderas and Re Rebecca Romjin, Romjin Stamos. Uh, I've got to confess, I've only seen it once. I want to see it again, but it's not on TV that much. Um, it's okay, kind of 6 out of 10. His next film, uh, I think this should have been a hit for him. I think, uh, although it's flawed, um, I think this is a good film. Again, I think he shoots it abroad. It's got um, uh, foreign funding from France and Germany, but it's um, The Black Dahlia. So this is based on the James Elroy, Elroy novel. So obviously... Uh, L.A. Confidential was a big hit based on an Elroy novel. So again, you know, De Palma, this is a bit late in the, the, the day, 2006, you know, he'd done this earlier. But this is quite interesting. Um, it, uh, you know, explores the uh, Black Dahlia murder, the famous murder in Los Angeles, which was unsolved, uh, horrific. Um, but I think it captures that really well. Um, it's actually quite Argentoish. Again, there's a death in it of one of the characters, and it's pure Argento. He basically falls down a big stair, central stairwell and gets his head impaled on a spike or something um, it's fantastic fantastic sort of De Palma uh, giallo riffing on the giallo genre um Vilma Sigmund comes uh, in for the photography on this um I forget uh, I think he did one of the films before we're talking about great great cinematographer and it's really well lensed um again probably needed a better lead than Josh Hartnett and Scarlett Johansson uh, supporting cast better but Fiona Shaw dreadfully overacts um Fiona Shaw's a funny actress, absolutely magnificent in um, uh, Killing Eve, but, um, you know, ruined uh, one of the seasons of um, uh, True Blood, and um, she's uh, just gone batshit in this. He's a funny one to partner with actors. He is capable and has directed some great performances, you know, Sissy Spacer, Piper Laurie, Pacino on two occasions, Connery um, and De Niro, Travolta in his best performance. Um, you know, uh, he is really good with actors, but sometimes it's like he's not, maybe not interested. I don't know. Sometimes he'll be focused on something else. He's 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 strange in that way as a filmmaker. Um, you can't predict him, and I think that's why why he's so interesting. But the the Black Dahlia is again, it's a really good second level De Palma. 